are about calculating stormwater volume and total suspended solids, re, total suspended solid reduction in ur, under the urban tree canopy. We have a couple of great speakers here or with us today. We have Dane Woodell and Steve Gaffield. Both of them have studied at UW Madison and um, they're going to walk us through their, their experience and their research that they've done um, throughout the years, um, learning more about this subject and what it, what it means for implica implications for the urban tree canopy. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna kind of let Dane start and give his intro and uh, we'll get going right away. Oh, one more thing before, before Mary mutes me, everybody will be on mute. Uh, please use the chat box um, for, for any questions, and we'll try to get those answered just as we always do at the end of the speaker's presentation. All right, I'll uh, share my screen then. And um, Steve, if you want to get unmuted too. Um, everyone see this okay? Is this working? You're in um, slide view, Dane, just so you know, or note, note view. Oh, am I? Yep. Lo siento, let me try that again. Is that, that, that working? I see it. Is, is it in, in the presentation mode though, Steve? It's not, you may wanna un, unshare and then just- Yeah, that, uh, okay, that's fair yeah. too. Sorry about that. Okay. And I thought 2020 was over, you know? <laughs> It's like one of those, how many engineers does it take to screw in a light bulb jokes? <laughs> okay, let's see. Well, while, while Dane is floundering with slides, um, I'll say hi, I'm Steve Gaffield with, Dane and I are both with the water resources firm, Emmons and Alviera Resources in the upper Midwest. For, water resources consultants who've kind of gotten sucked into the research world a little bit here, but uh, we're consulting engineers. Um, there are actually some honest to God researchers you're lucky enough to have in the audience here today, Bill Selbig from USGS and Steve Lohide from University of Wisconsin. Thanks you guys for making time to join us. Um, hopefully the Q and A, they'll be able to provide some input on research and answer some questions you have. So. Looks, uh, looking forward to a good discussion with you all. Um, we're gonna start here with kind of a case study of a project that pulled us into this issue about urban tree hydrology and the impacts in stormwater, and then move to the big picture. Um, we got pulled into this as kind of a tangent on a consulting job, which will tell you the story. And over the last few years, it's led to an interesting journey, getting to know who's doing what around the country in research and policy initiatives related to this issue about urban trees and stormwater. But as you'll see, if you don't already know, it's very much an emerging field, a lot to figure out in terms of research and putting it into practice. Next slide, Dean. So we'll start the details, move to the big picture. The project that got us into this was on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus. So describe that, talk a little bit about trees and the hydrologic cycle in the urban environment. Dane will talk about the spreadsheet tool that we used as essentially a hack for the common wind slam stormwater quality model it's used for design and regulatory compliance uh, as a proof of concept. And then just talk about where other people are taking this, the thoughts that we have, things that we've been doing and, and lead into a discussion with all of you. Next. So here's an aerial shot of University of Wisconsin-Madison campus. It's adjacent to Lake Mendota. Uh, the project in question was stormwater plan for a redevelopment of six parcels on the campus close to the lake. The university facilities managers wanted to take an integrated look at stormwater in this area as opposed to one by one parcel analysis. and really wanted to push green infrastructure and volume control. And in Madison, Lake levels and flooding are a concern. It's impacted a lot of people and property. 
And the university has set a very lofty voluntary goal uh, to minimize impacts the campus has on uh, this volume issue in lake levels. And that's to try to achieve the runoff volume that would have occurred under native vegetation. So this isn't pre-development, like, you know, ag land. This is prairie, wetlands, uh, native forest. Uh, it's voluntary. There's no regulatory strings attached, but it's uh, a lofty goal that they've set and hats off to them for doing that. Um, water quality was also part of this project, total suspended solids. Um, it's the regulatory parameter It's driven by the municipal stormwater permit and a TMDL for the Rock River Basin. And they asked us to use the Winsland model that I mentioned previously. I realize I don't know if that's widely used in, in Illinois. Um, in Wisconsin, it's one of the standard tools for water quality and stormwater site design and permitting. Um, so widely accepted and familiar to the, the regulators, Wisconsin DNR. Next. So the university is very interested in green infrastructure the facilities. Folks there have implemented several green roofs, permeable pavement demonstrations, a little bit of rainwater harvesting and reuse for irrigation. So we looked at those things, uh, as well as other types of water harvesting, reusing it for toilet flushing, for instance, native landscaping to reduce runoff. And then one of the landscape architects on campus we were working said, hey, what about trees? What if we planted a lot of trees? Would that help? And Dana and I thought, well, good question. We'll get back to you. Um, so we thought about that. We thought about this model we were asked to use again, common model in the design world, Winslam. But well, what can we do with this and what can't we? So as quick background, Winslam, it's a rainfall runoff pollutant loading model. It's database driven. So it's got a lot of data embedded in it from decades of research, Wisconsin and elsewhere, about uh, pollutant loading characteristics on different land uses, as well as uh, treatment of biofilters and permeable pavement and uh, wet ponds and many, some new and many old DMPs. It's a continuous model in Wisconsin. The tradition, the standard is to run the 1981 annual rainfall series because that's close to the mythical average year in terms of precipitation. Um, it doesn't model trees, at least not yet. The developers are interested in what we've done and you know that could happen someday down the road, but this is what we had to work with. Next, Dane. Won't go into all the details, but it's a complex model. Uh, it's got pollutant loading routines, as I said, are based on data, input, you know, a lot of the standard stuff, but rainfall series to apply to the model domain, uh, sediment, particle size distributions, um, pollutant loading information. Um, you can put in different types of land uses. So you can have a study area like this. UW campus, it's got streets and parking lots and roofs and lawns and athletic fields. Um, you can put in different types of BMPs um, and output, you get annual pollutant loads, annual runoff volume and treatment efficiency, percent TSS removed. Next. So trees are important part of the hydrologic cycle in the urban environment. Um, as I said, we've got some true experts here who can answer more questions later. Um, I think we can all relate to standing under a tree in the rain. You realize the canopy intercepts a fair amount of rain. Some of it gets through, um, some, of it's, uh, some of it's intercepted and delayed or detained on the leaves, but uh, trees can influence the soil characteristics and therefore infiltration capacity of the soil below them. They cause shading, they affect surface temperature, which affects evaporation. Uh, they affect wind, which again can affect evaporation, possibly even where the rain falls. Um, Steve Lohide at UW-Madison, I think is looking at funneling effects of the trees, uh, funnel rainfall between them. Uh, I'd be curious to hear more about that, but there's a lot going on. Um, and we didn't focus on all of that. We focused on canopy interception here for simplicity and because that was related to the question that was asked of us. 
Next slide. So tree canopy inter interactions can sort of simplistically be broken down into interception, which is water that's retained on branches and leaves on the tree. Stem flow, which is water that actually flows down the branches and the stem and reaches the ground by, by flowing down the surface of the tree trunk. And then through fall is what comes through the canopy and gets you wet if you're standing under a tree in the rain. Next slide. So our approach for this project, again, is this was trying to answer a question that our client UW had asked was, well, let's look at this in a proof of concept way. Um, we need to see what we can do to integrate it with this existing wind slam model that uh, is standard to use for these types of projects. So what we did is we came up with a way, which Dane will describe, to modify the rainfall input into the wind slam model to simulate what is actually through fall from trees. Um, didn't account for stem flow. We didn't account for uh, changing soil conditions under trees and infiltration. Uh, but this is strictly looking at the tree canopy and the impact on rainfall and what that means for, for runoff. And with that, Dane, take it away for the details. Yeah, we will do. Uh, before we get too carried away on the modeling, um, do you want to just kind of talk contextually about this idea of not you know, accounting for stem flow and some of the changes in, in soil characteristics. I think a picture like we've got here sort of illustrates that you know, in an urban setting, it's fairly appropriate to do that. And with the project we were working on, we felt like you know, we we're looking at sort of a, at least semi-urban, if not a full-fledged urban uh, development scenario. So the, the soil underneath a lot of these canopies is gonna be asphalt or pavement or something that's going to be impervious. And in, in a lot of these kind of planters, there's limited uh, capacity for soils to accept um, stormwater. So we started off with a literature review and we looked at some monitoring data we found um, from a California study that looked at interception as a percentage of rainfall for a couple of, of trees, an oak tree and a pear tree. I'll point out here that the, the two particular specimens they were looking at were kind of isolated. So we're not looking at an oak tree that's in a stand of 20 or so or something like that. This is, these are trees that are kind of out in the open. Um, we didn't have any available Wisconsin data at the time. I'm not going to play too much of a spoiler, but we'll, we'll get into that topic a little later about um, some, of the, some of the data that, that may be um, forthcoming. But the, the, the literature we did find indicated that Interception depth increases with rainfall depth, but the percentage of that rainfall that's intercepted decreases with rainfall. And this graph over here kind of shows that. If you look um, on the y-axis, we've got interception as a percentage of the rainfall. So going from you know, zero up to 100%. And on the x-axis, total rainfall. So if you look at an event that's maybe two millimeters, you go up and say, okay, that's about 50% that's intercepted or one millimeter. So we'll go look at a bigger event then, like a 10 millimeter rainfall maybe closer to 20% or two, or two millimeters. So the depth's getting larger and larger as the rainfall is getting larger, but the percentage of the overall rain event is, is diminishing. So we took that data and then we fit a regression equation to it, found a similar um, relationship in another study. So we felt good about that, that there was some agreement, even though you know we're only looking at a, a data from a couple of trees. One thing we noticed was that the data we had was kind of accounting for um, interception in, in a full leaf out situation. And we wanted to have some sort of seasonal waiting for leaf growth. Oops, sorry about that. I looked this up and there's between 400 billion and 3 trillion trees in the world. We had data on two of them. So I'd say we had a pretty small sample size, limited data, but it's something I think we could easily refine um, with more data and obviously uh, with, with local data, I think would be um, really, really useful to, to incorporate in, in any kind of modeling scheme looking at trees. Another um, limitation we had was we could only consider areas with full canopy coverage. This had to do with rainfall data being a global input to the model. When, in Winslam, you can't say this part of a watershed is going to get this rainfall file and then another part of the watershed is going to get a different rainfall file. Um, so we're, it was kind of an all or nothing approach. <laughs> And finally, we, we didn't consider antecedent moisture in, in the canopy, which uh, can impact um, 
like a, a continuous model like this if you have back-to-back -back events. So our model takes um, into account the, the interception in the canopy and then before the next uh, rain comes, we're assuming that it's either evaporated or I guess it could be like a flock of really thirsty birds come or something, but it's, it's being disposed of prior to that next rain event. So we took that handy dandy regression equation and applied it to each of the, the um, rain events in that 1981 rainfall series. One thing we did to be a little conservative and then also um, was kind of based on some of the literature we saw is we capped off interception for any given event at about a 10th of an inch. So we went through with our regression equation um, and then reduced the rainfall accordingly. As you can kind of see in the um, event that are, that are shown on the slide here, the, the green is the interception depth and then the um, rainfall depth that was left over is, is shown in blue. And if we go and tally all that up, you, we end up with interception volume accounting for about 12% of the, the annual rainfall. <laughs> just want to go through the calculation to show how, how kind of simple the, the calculation ends up being. So in, in this case, we'll look at April 12, 1981 in uh, a little bit greater detail. In, in the 1981 series, that the rainfall depth there is 13 hundredths of an inch, which is the input to our um, regression equation. And when we crunch the numbers on that, the calculated percent intercepted is just under 40%. Now it's April, and so we're thinking that there's some leaves on trees, but they're not fully developed. Um, so we have a growth adjustment factor of 0 0.5 for April. So to calculate the interception depth, we take that original rainfall, the 13 hundredths of an inch, multiply by the percent intercepted, and then multiply that by our growth adjustment factor. In this case, we end up with just under three hundredths of an inch. So then our adjusted precipitation is that 13 hundredths minus three hundredths, which gives us a tenth of an inch. And we developed a spreadsheet that basically converted the standard wind slam rain, which you can kind of see in, in gray here, um, applied our interception regression equation and then any seasonal multipliers to come up with the depth of, of rain in any of these given events that would end up on the tree canopy subtracted that from the original rainfall depth to end up with a adjusted daily precipitation. And, and that adjusted daily precipitation is what's gonna be input to, to one of our slam runs. So we took that edited rain file and ran it in a really simple wind slam model. We've got, um, you can see here just a, a source area and then we're modeling a, a bioretention or facility or, or a biofilter in the parlance of wind slam. And we're going to look at this model with the, the regular 1981 wind rainfall series and then our modified rainfall series. And then we're going to kind of compare and contrast the, the differences. Just on the source area level, the annual runoff volume and TSS load were reduced um, by 11% with the, um, the, the tree coverage. A uh, couple things to touch on here. The reason that the um, the model result is 11% and what we had just talked about was 12% has to do with rounding errors kind of within wind slam um, and, and the, the precipitation data that goes into it. So um, things like, like we'd calculate something to the nearest thousandth and you can only input the nearest hundredth. So you're rounding up to that. It accounts for the differences. Runoff volume and TSS in this model too are gonna be kind of joined at the hip because the TSS calculation is based on a volume and a concentration of whatever pollutant you're looking at. So those numbers going forward are gonna kinda always be the same. Um, and finally, we noticed significant improvement in the performance of this downstream um, bioretention facility, which we'll touch on a little bit later here. So we conducted this analysis kind of with a retrofit in mind, um, had sort of a large contributing area relative to our uh, BMP size. We wanted to keep things simple so we looked at runoff from one acre of parking lot um, under the tree, the tree canopy, which again is that um, simulated by this modified rainfall input. And then we kind of wanted to, to look at how the performance might vary um, if we looked at some parameters of our BMP. So we, we looked at adjusting the area of the BMP, um, the depth of engineered soil kind of in a cross section view of it. And then we wanted to vary some of the native soil infiltration rates as well. 
And the, the result of this was that we had about 15 to 17% volume in TSS reduction, kind of based on whatever scheme we were um, looking at. We varied the biofilter area from 500 to 1,000 square feet. That was somewhat of an arbitrary um, selection there. Engineered soil depth, we varied from one foot to two feet. And so two feet is kind of the design standard in Wisconsin. If you look at Wisconsin's DNR, Wisconsin DNR's um, guidance. And this project, if you'll recall, was really close to a lake. So in some places we had issues where putting in two feet wasn't feasible because of lake levels and, and some of the elevation constraints. The native soil infiltration rates we selected are a little more thoughtful. The 0.13 inches per hour was the low and 1.6 inches per hour was the high. The low is um, kind of the, the lowest infiltration rate that you would still be expected to meet infiltration requirements in Wisconsin. Basically acknowledging if you have kind of lousy soils that infiltration doesn't make sense in every site. In Wisconsin, the way we do that in a lot of instances is looking at a morphological evaluation of the soil and ascribing uh, infiltration rate to that. And per the guidance, anything kind of below uh, 1.3 inches per hour would be assigned to a, a, a soil with considerable clay content, a, a place would be you know, pretty poor for infiltration. 1.6 inches per hour represents the, the high side of things. And that's kind of a conservative assumption for a native sand. Um, we, we do measure this um, infiltration rates in sand quite a bit and find it to be quite a bit higher in, in a lot of cases, but we don't really know about silt seams, other kind of maybe glacial leftovers that would be in these sand deposits. So 1.6 is sort of a conservatively low estimation of a, a sand's ability to infiltrate water. And we kind of, you know, like I said, looked at um, varying each of these, these parameters and ended up with 15 to 17% volume and TSS reduction um, from the, the tree canopy. We've kind of had an ear to the ground on this issue for, for a while and noticed that there's some observations from ongoing studies in Wisconsin caused us to revisit our assumption of, of capping interception at a tenth of an inch for any given um, rain event. We, we bumped it up to two tenths of an inch and the interception uh, jumped up from 12% to about 14% of the, the annual rainfall. And again, we'd have a similar reduction in the, the source area TSS loading. We also saw another study that was conducted in a place that starts with an L and is in Slovenia. And um, they were looking at kind of an interesting um, concept here. And that, that was looking at what the influence of, of the size of, of raindrops had to do on, on the water balance that, that Steve was talking about before. Not quite what we're, what we're interested in, but they did provide some really, really neat data that we, we were kind of excited about. They had rainfall and throughfall events uh, or uh, data for multiple events. That's what the graph here shows. On the y-axis, we've got depth of water. On the x-axis, we've got time. The blue curve is rainfall and the orange and green curves are throughfall through um, two different species of trees. Another thing they noticed is that the interception depth tended to be a lot larger than the stem flow depth. And that kind of reinforced some of the assumptions that we had with our original um, stem flow, or original wind slam model where we were disregarding stem flow, et cetera. The data showed um, unsurprisingly that there was a volume reduction. That's kind of the point of everything we, we, I just went through. But they also um, showed some peak attenuation capabilities as well. So we thought that was pretty interesting. We thought, why don't we do some sort of peak of, uh, proof of concept peak flow analysis? Um, say that one really fast 10 times once and just tell me how it goes. <laughs> we um, incorporated that event specific data into HydroCAD, which is uh, a, a model we use quite a bit in Wisconsin um, for design um, storm kind of peak flow calculations using curve number methodology, TR55. Um, and we figured we could run the rainfall and then those two throughfall curves also. Because we're using curve number methodology, we wanted to use data from the, the largest rain event that they, they had in this data set. Some of the, the um, assumptions of, of the curve number methodology kind of fall apart when you're looking at really small rain events. And there, there are a lot of small events in this data set. So we've got data from two tree species. We again want to keep things kind of simple. So we've got just a one acre watershed. 
Um, we wanted to simulate pre-development conditions just because that's such a classic design um, situation, at least in Wisconsin, where we're looking at um, our stormwater management meeting pre-development peak flows for a, a series of, of different events. Just for the sake of argument, we uh, selected row crop agriculture um, with a hydrologic soil group rating of C. And then we wanted to evaluate peak flows in a post-development condition that we assumed was impervious. And we run those post-development models kind of with and without canopy coverage. So we'll just kind of summarize the results first. Uh, the rainfall depth that we ended up selecting was 1.3 inches, which is probably on the low end of what you'd want for um, curve number methodology, but at least kind of passed the laugh test to us. Our pre-development run with a curve number of 78, again, that's indicative of these the agriculture with, with a hydrologic soil rating of C. It's six tenths of a CFS. In our post-development model, it's that where it's bumping the curve number up to 98 to account for um, pavement or some other impervious surface being added. And that ends up being 3.6 CFS uh, uh, when we run the model. And then we took that same post-development model with the, the curve number of 98 and ran the through fall for a black pine, which is this orange curve here. And then also for this birch, which is the green curve here. We saw a significant uh, reduction in peak flow. As you can see here, we've got the uh, post-development of when we're running the rainfall of 3.6 CFS. And then based on the tree, we're slashing that down to either 2.9 or even 1.3. Um, part of that, I think, has to do with, with volume reduction itself. So on this uh, graph over here, you can see that this orange curve is basically a shrunken version of the, the blue rainfall curve. It, the peaks hit at kind of the same um, time. And there's a little attenuation over in the tail, but it's more or less, it looks like sort of a shrunken version of the rainfall. But there's also a, a, an attenuation component. And I think that kind of really comes up in the, this green curve, which is the through fall for a birch. You can really see the, the peaks much lower. It's more drawn out. Um, one thing that's interesting with those two curves is that the volume reduction is the same, really similar for both, both species. And you can see that with the area under the curve um, for the, the orange curve and that, that green curve are very similar. Yet there's a huge reduction in the, the, um, the peak flow rates. That suggests to me that the physical properties of the trees really influence the, the attenuation. I should note here that the, the trees we're looking at had a, a similar um, diameter at breast height. And I, I believe the, the canopy area was also similar. So things like the, the surface characteristics of the leaves, the branch angles, things like that, I think really, um, at least this suggests to me, ha have a significant impact on the, the attenuation aspect of, um, of what trees do. And with that, that's kind of all I've got in terms of um, summarizing the, the models we ran. I'm going to Turn it back over to Steve. We'll talk about some of the next steps and some of the tools and ongoing research and and um, other other um, topics, kind of underneath the, the canopy, so to speak. So recall that the modeling Dan just described is just a spinoff from a question a client asked: Hey, would it help if we planted trees, and how much? So is a quick proof of concept to say, yeah, it would. And here's, here's some rough information to bracket how much we're talking about. Um, so what's next? What else is going on around the country? Um, this is a topic of university research, UW-Madison, as we've mentioned, um, Tennessee, University of Tennessee, um, some work going on at University of Minnesota. Um, Agencies are involved, the US Forest Service, as you might expect, big player, uh, gentleman Eric Keeler at US Forest Service in Atlanta. Um, it's been heavily involved in developing and funding some of these initiatives. Uh, and then in the nonprofits, as many nonprofit organizations involve um, trying to understand and promote urban forestry, and get a handle on, on benefits. Um, so there's research, there's policy initiatives, and some of those groups are working to develop 
tools that can be used for uh, planning and potentially design. Next thing. I mentioned University of Tennessee, Professor John Hathaway down there. It's been doing research. Here's just an example. Um, mentioned the paucity of data that we had to work with locally as far as urban tree hydrology or any tree hydrology. Um, John and his students have been collecting data. Here's an example from some maple, oak, and pine. Um, the interception numbers they're finding are interesting, a bit higher than we have. It'd be interesting to look at the details, but um, wanted to mention that th those folks are doing research, collecting some more data from the United States on different tree species. Um, and uh, another thing that was interesting observation is the uh, impact of the tree canopy seemed to be more variable for larger events. And, um, you know, it's related to amount of wind um, or other factors, but um, I guess not too surprising. Next. Um, so it's ongoing research. We're lucky to have two of the researchers on this project attending today um, from the USGS in Middleton, Wisconsin and, and University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so there's an opportunity to take lemons and make lemonade in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin related to the emerald ash borer. Uh, there are a couple of medium density uh, residential streets with different levels of infestation and tree removal planned. So these folks have been doing detailed high frequency hydrologic uh, monitoring before and after tree removal. One of the streets, one of the catchments, 60% of the ash trees removed during this study. So this is work in progress, but it's an opportunity to look at before and after tree removal and what are the implications for stormwater volume, soil moisture, tree water uptake, uh, and groundwater interactions. So we're excited to see the results of, of this study. Next. Um, you know, there's an important note here. There's a water quality component of urban trees, which is very important to keep in mind. Um, you might've seen this, but leaves in the streets are a significant source of dissolved phosphorus in stormwater runoff. Um, it doesn't mean trees are bad, you know, trees dropping, leaves and litter, pollen, spring, for instance, and leaves and fall. Obviously it's a natural process, but with the urban infrastructure, you know, now we've got a very efficient conduit that lets runoff pass through these leaves, essentially make phosphorus tea and get into sewers and quickly get to receiving waters. Um, some of the work that Bill Selbig at USGS has done has shown that timely street sweeping can be quite effective at mitigating that phosphorus load. Other management options would be useful to have too. And I know people are working on that, but that's an important thing to remember, um, but not a rationale to not have urban trees. Next. In the policy world, uh, organizations like the Center for Watershed Protection, uh, thinking about stormwater credits and realizing there are very few communities that provide any kind of stormwater credit for trees. And they developed an analytical tool calculator to look at stormwater quality um, and stormwater utility crediting schemes. And you know, they've been promoting this around the country, um, thinking credit generation for trees is a way to provide an incentive for urban forestry. Um, talking with regulators, you know, there's a lot of questions. Um, is this consistent with the way municipal or state regulations are developed? Um, you know, are trees reliable or too ephemeral? Um, I saw there was a question in the chat box too about does performance increase with tree age? And well, yes, it does, you know, up to a point of maturity. So there's a lot of issues that would need to get proved out um, to implement this from the feedback I've gotten. But this policy initiative is, is underway and it's an interesting idea. Next. I mentioned the Forest Service, they have a suite of modeling tools, the iTree suite. Just as an example, they've applied these, and these are really planning tools to help communities understand big picture benefits of trees. They looked at the Atlanta metro area, published this in Stormwater Magazine last year. Um, 
won't run through all of the details, but you can look at tree distribution throughout a large area and look at what does that mean for runoff to a local stream in a watershed, as well as other benefits. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. Um, they demonstrated substantial stormwater runoff and Atlanta's under a descent consent decree to reduce runoff related to combined sewer overflows. And this is an important part of their strategy to beat that. But there's also air pollutant reduction benefits, there's carbon sequestration, heating and cooling benefits, forest service calculations. So, you know, these are millions and millions of dollars worth of benefits. Next. Go ahead, too. That this is just kind of a, um, maybe a, a hidden cost of, of some of what you might call urban sprawl, too. Um, you know, trees that are in place, maybe not being protected. Um, and being cut down, there's there's some reason to think that there's stormwater uh, issues that arise from that, and then um, pollutant issues, and, and basically all, all of these these uh, different benefits that that Steve has mentioned are kind of going in reverse as as trees are being chopped down to, to put in strip malls, etc. Great. Next slide, Dane. Uh, another planning tool. It's under development, and this is work in progress and the final report pending and funded by the Forest Service um, is the tree and stormwater calculator. It's a spreadsheet tool, uses curve number hydrology, you know, getting a little closer to our common engineering world, um, predicts runoff volume and pollutant load reductions with different scenarios. You can put in different watershed areas. You can look at present trees and what if trees are lost as Dane was describing, what if more trees are, are planted. Um, looks at individual events, looks like annual totals. They make the point of saying, you know, this isn't intended for permitting and design. It's still, you know, it's a planning tool. Questions in our mind are, although this, these tools are very interesting to help understand in general what the benefits are, um, how can they be integrated into planning and design efforts? Dan, next slide. So some site design questions, thinking about closer to our world. On the regulatory side, there's the open question, will trees get credits? Is that will drive whether they're part of a stormwater management plan officially or not? Um, there are design models that can handle this. You know, the short answer is no, not yet. You know, we've done some this proof of concept work, but there are model hacks and um, based on limited data. Um, what about non-regulatory benefits? Um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, and kind of excited, this is, uh, there's potential to retrofit urban areas where this is kind of out of the barn for gray infrastructure. The sewers are there, there's no room for a basin, but trees are something that could be planted and potential for some benefit. Next slide, please. So there's really, there's a need for design tools that engineers can use. Um, needs to expand upon the proof of concept tools such as we've developed um, and find ways to migrate some of these more robust planning tools like the Forest Service has developed to things that could actually be applied to a design scale and design problem, um, as well as just some guidance. Of what are the appropriate parameters to put in? in terms of maximum interception depth and tree canopy characteristics and so on. Next. Um, and there's a lot of different hydrologic processes to represent in a stormwater model. Again, we looked at one of them, tree canopy interception, but trees affect the soil below it and infiltration capacity, um, you know, affect evaporation, temperature, it's a lot going on. Um, there's also the issue about partial canopy coverage. As Dane mentioned, wind slam, like, like all of the standard design models we know of, you apply one rainfall to the whole, whole model. So the trick we came up with, just it won't work for a realistic scenario of you've got trees in this area and you don't have them here. And that affects how much rainfall hits the ground and uh, treed in, in untreed areas. 
Um, can it be location within a site? Probably matters as far as runoff timing, um, all sorts of things to figure out. Um, and then there's this, what about tree growth? You know, a tree that was planted last year you know, is nowhere near the function of a tree that was planted 20 years ago. And how, you, how do you factor that in? Um, we have some ideas of tricks. We don't have to go into the details, but um, you know, this is something for the model developers and, and regulators to keep working on. Um, just to wrap up, um, it's the lesson learned. Urban trees provide lots of functions, hydrologic and otherwise. They're aesthetic, they're cool. There's a lot of mental health benefits associated with greenery, um, their habitat. Um, understanding of urban tree hydrology is evolving. We've got again, some experts who can speak to that here, but um, we're, we're learning a lot as we go here. Um, nutrient loading is a challenge. How do you deal with that? Again, I don't see it as a reason not to have urban trees, but it's a real deal with. Um, available models are, are works in progress. Um, so it's, it's a young field in that regard. Um, but I think there's really some exciting opportunities and be interested to hear feedback from, from all of you. Um, you can combine addressing stormwater, uh, climate, livability, equity between neighborhoods. It's no secret many poor um, underserved neighborhoods also have few trees and that has a lot of impacts on the neighborhood. Um, and one example is, although it's not a regulatory issue, it might not be something that gets credit, but um, can an urban, uh, an urban forest help reduce the burden on the stormwater system and reduce capital costs? In other words, the less water you have flowing into storm sewers, uh, the more adequate the capacity is. And there might be a real benefit there, even if stormwater credits aren't available, um, there's not regulatory credit, there could be a, a real capital improvement benefit to, to urban trees. So with that, we'll stop. We'll thank you all for your uh, attention and questions that are rolling in, and we'll answer as many as we can. And we can also, Bill and Steve, invite you to be unmuted and chime in with questions or comments or answer questions also. Thank you, Steve and Dane. We appreciate it. I am gonna start with, with some of the questions um, and thank you all of you who put questions in the chat box. There's still opportunity if you have a question that comes up. Um, and I know Steve, you answered this question, but um, just so, so everybody hears it, uh, not everybody always knows how to work their way to the chat box or go through it. Um, the first question was, did the study consider compacted urban soils? And so if you want to re-answer that, Steve, that would be great. Um, we didn't explicitly, but the Winslam model has that sort of implicitly baked in based on the runoff characteristics and pollutant loading characteristics for urban areas. So it has nothing to do with the work that we did, but because the model is, is data-based, data um, that is represented in a way. Thank you. That and is also it's one of the things you can do in a, in a Winslam model is sort of, um, it's even qualitatively assigned different compaction levels um, for s some of the inputs. Slam's kind of a black box in terms of what that actually means, but there are a couple of knobs to twist that, that will account for compaction more directly in addition to what Steve is talking about where the, the data that is kind of the backbone of it was, you know, derived from those kind of soils as well. Outstanding, thank you. Um, the next question is, what was the density of the biofilters that was modeled? Was it 100% of the total runoff area or a percentage of the total area? It was a really small percentage. It's actually one thing, if I had a mulligan, I probably would would redo. So the, the, the area was 100% of the, the area, um, the catchment area went to the biofilter, but it's almost like hilariously undersized. I mean, it's an acre coming at it and a thousand square feet. So the facility area ratio is, you know, way off the charts and a lot larger than you'd want. Um, and kind of the, to the point that it's, it's in my opinion, a little cartoonish, but that was sort of the idea with a, a retrofit kind of 
jam something in where you can as opposed to have you know all this um, a bunch of pristine area but but yeah it's um a, a, a large contributing area going to a very small uh, bmp okay thank you and does the amount of runoff and tss intercepted increase with the age of the th tree i know steve you talked about this for a second but if we could address it formally Sure. Short answer is yes, it, it definitely does. Um, and it's related to, I think, primarily canopy size, but also canopy density. So the big tree has a bigger, taller, thicker canopy, more well-developed. So, you know, this is infrastructure that takes time to, to grow, years to mm -hmm. grow. Um, so it does in, in a similar way as in the spring when a mature tree is leaping out. You know, it's kind of gradually ramping up over a month or so to, to the full function. Thank you. Um, next question. The USGS has a precipitation lab in Madison. Did they collaborate with you in any part of the study? Um, Bill reviewed this study. Um, and we've talked to Bill, you know, numerous times <laughs> since then, just kind of brainstorming where, where to go with this. But um, no formal collaboration. Um, this is rogue consultants going off and doing something interesting and then chatting with folks about it. Um, but we've, uh, yeah, we'd love to do some tag along work, um, you know, continue to, to see if there's ways to help put these, uh, these studies into practice. And Bill, if you're on, if you, anything you wanna say, the floor is all yours. Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, great job, Steve, Dane, and I really have anything to comment in addition to what you said other than I am, I work for the USGS and I am not aware of any precipitation map. So maybe I, uh, maybe I missed that one. Okay. Uh, what are the best species of trees to plant that prevent, that prevent, sorry, to plant that help minimize, minimize or prevent water runoff? That's a really good question, I think. Um, one of them, I think in that I tree suite, there, there's probably the tools to answer that that better. Um, but that to me is kind of one of the, the, the next steps is to sort of look at, at trees from a stormwater perspective. And, and I, I think we we're kind of hinting at that, looking at the peak flows and the attenuation being so different between a, a birch tree and a, a pine tree, um, for instance, and that's something that that ought to be cataloged and I'm sure there's, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but I think there's a good chance that, that we'll find that some species are better than others for um, whatever stormwater management purposes you may have. I know there, there are some trees that have kind of, that, that have caused problems next to trout streams, for instance, because they take up a lot of water, perhaps in a, in a um, urban setting that might be useful for volume control, stuff like that. Um, I think that's a great question and a great place to sort of advance the this topic. Right. One generalization is evergreen trees can keep the canopy year round, and it also is a high surface area canopy, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons those uh, the runoff rate results birch versus pine were, were surprising because it seems sort of counterintuitive. So shows you know what we know and don't know, but. Um, Evergreens in general, you know, it's a year-round canopy, high surface area. So in general, the, the volume retained seems to be quite high from what we've seen. Thank you. Too, with, with the needles, they have like a, a higher leaf area index. And that's if you poke around this you'll um, topic, you'll start running into leaf area index just about everywhere, you know, on turn, overturn a stone. Um, that, that has stormwater benefits as well. I think Dane just wanted to use poke and needle in the same sentence. Um, <laughs> so the next question was about the URL uh, for Sarah, the planning tool. Can and I uh, jump in here for a sec? This is Steve Lohide. Sure. Um, I, I uh, in response to the questions about size, that's some of the things I'm Steve Lohide, professor of civil environmental engineering at UW Madison and working with Bill Selvig and, and others. And some of these questions that I'm hearing are exactly what we're interested in and in, in wondering what species are most important and uh, how big the tree is, how does that matter? And so we have some, some work that we're looking at using drones 
to look at the architecture of the tree and its shape and are finding that, you know, it's not only through fall and interception at one point, and if that's what is uh, applicable for the entire tree, but there's actually a lot of spatial variability underneath the tree and looking at how the, the water is redirected as it moves through the canopy and whether, it, whether the spacing of trees, which is of course far from random in the urban environment, how, whether that redirects it towards the terrace or towards the, the streets or the driveways or the sidewalks. And so you know, those are some of the, the questions we're getting at. So um, great to hear, hear the interest in it. Thank you, Steve. Uh, a couple more questions. There was a question about the URL um, listed. I just want to make a note to everybody. Um, the, the presentations will be sent out. Um, and we will also have a recording of this on our um, YouTube page. And so it'll be available for everybody to view and you'll be able to see that URL um, rather than me say it to everybody verbally. Um, so another question um, of our second to last question is for nutrient loading, do you compensate for the nutrients that the trees are taking up? No, for us, we didn't. Um, big picture that's an important thing to do there's a limitation to what we did so um no and you know bill and steve maybe can address that more eloquently you know we, we've seen a number of studies uh, the center for watershed protection credit calculator for instance um, is very much focused on nutrient uptake by trees and the reduction there um, i don't know that those tools account for leaves dropping on uh, impervious surfaces and having that dissolved phosphorus going away in the stormwater. So uh, it's complicated, but no, we did not. Okay, thank you. And our final question, was TSS reduction just correlated with runoff reduction or was it estimated separately? That, that um, model output is in tandem from Winslam. It's a bit of a black box on exactly how that works. Um, but by and large, the TSS kind of comes along for the ride with runoff reduction. I know a significant portion of it has to do with um, taking the volume and, and the concentration that, that's kind of pulled from the, the empirical data it's based, that the software is based off of, and then sort of doing the, the calculation to come up with a, with, with, with a load. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. That's all of our questions. Uh, we really appreciate um, our friends from, from the North talking to us about some of the work you guys have done at, at UW-Madison. Um, and um, I hope everybody got a lot out of this. I know, I know I did. I'm sure our soil scientists from the county that are on this call loved every minute of it. Um, and it also gives us something to take to, to think about from a regulatory perspective um, at, our, at our local agencies here. And so thank you again. And um, I think we are finished a little bit early. So um, I guess everybody will have five minutes to relax before their next Zoom. Um, have a great day. Thanks everyone. Take care.